Hello, everybody. My name is Elizabeth Barr, and I'd like to welcome you to the meeting today. Before we get started, I would like to advise everyone that this meeting is being recorded. If you do not wish to participate in a recorded meeting, you can disconnect at this time. The agenda is displayed here. All participants um, should remain muted during the presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them in the chat and we will address as many as possible during the question and answer session after the presentation. We will also paste a link to a SurveyMonkey feedback survey in the chat. This is a voluntary anonymous survey that will provide you with an opportunity to make suggestions for future topics or speakers for our scientific interest group. And we appreciate your time to complete it. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Elena Gorodetsky, Research Program Officer in the Basic and Translational Research Section of the Office of Research on Women's Health and the co-chair of this SIG. Good afternoon, everyone. And on behalf of the Office of Research on Women's Health, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this meeting of the Sex and Gender in Health and Disease Scientific Interest Group. The purpose of the SIG is to explore the influence of se sex as a biological variable and gender as a social construct on health and disease across lifespan. The SIG aims to promote the dissemination of research and foster potential interdisciplinary uh, collaboration among NIH scientists who work on or are interested aspects of sex-based research across the research continuum or in sex differences research relevant to health and disease. SIG also serves as a platform for cross-disciplinary connections. Next slide. You can join SIG and subscribe to our mailing list from SIG webpage. And we invite those you, of you who are not a member yet of, uh, to join the SIG. If you would like to receive information about today's SIG by email, please put your name and email address in the chat. And Dr. Elizabeth Barr will now introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Howard Young. Dr. Howard Young obtained his PhD in microbiology at the University of Washington and carried out postdoctoral research at the NCI under, his doctor, under doctors Edward Skolnick and Wade Parks. He was a member of the Laboratory of Molecular Immunoregulation at NCI Frederick from 1983 to 1989 prior to joining the NCI Frederick Laboratory of Experimental Immunology in 1989. He was president of the International Society for Interferon and Cytokine Research from 2004 to 2005 and served as chair of the Immunology Division of the American Society for Microbiology. He has also served as chair of the NIH Cytokine Interest Group and co-chair and then chair of the NIH Immunology Interest Group. He is a three-time recipient of the NIH Director's Award for Mentoring in 2000, 2006, and 2018. And in 2006, he received a National Public Service Award. He has also received the 2019 NCI Women's Scientist Mentoring Award and the International Cytokine and Interferon Society Honorary Membership Award and Distinguished Service Award. In addition, he is the inaugural recipient of the ICIS Mentoring Award. He is an elected member of the American Academy of Microbiology, and he is a member of the International Cytokine and Interferon Society, the American Society for Microbiology, the American Association of Immunology, and the AAAS, AAAS. He is now a senior investigator in the Laboratory of Cancer Immunometabolism in Frederick. Dr. Young. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to speak to my NIH colleagues about the work going on and to foster communication, collaboration, and cooperation between labs. Um, it's been a joy to work at NIH. 
And I urge all the young people to take advantage of the NIH community, because just remember, if you need help doing something, somebody at NIH is doing it. So make the most of your opportunities here and you will thrive. So I'm gonna tell you today about what started out as a very basic research project uh, that has resulted in insight into at least three diseases. And it was not our intention to develop models for those diseases. It was just that we asked a very basic research question. But first I'll show you that I'm gonna talk about interferon gamma today. And interferon gamma is one of the few cytokines with its own comic book or a comic strip. And you can see it's, it's uh, the interferon gamma is depicted as a female, and that's appropriate because women make more interferon gamma than men, and female mice make more interferon gamma than male mice. Um, and so this was done. I got the company to put the, the gamma on her arm, but I wanted a streak of blonde in her hair as well, but they wouldn't do that. But uh, nevertheless, they uh, have correctly depicted interferon gamma as a very strong woman. So interferon gamma has both pro-inflammatory effects and anti-inflammatory effects um, in the body. And I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but it just shows you that it's a critical cytokine. All cells have receptors for it, and it affects many, many different processes. And it was at first discovered, uh, or is one of the first, um, it turned out to be the first macrophage activating factor that was worked on by Bob Schreiber and Wash U, and he eventually discovered it was interferon gamma. But it has a lot of, as you can see from this slide, pro-inflammatory effects and anti-inflammatory effects. And so there's a balance between cancer therapy where interferon gamma is critical for all immunotherapy to occur. Although I've seen some recent papers where CAR T cells may not need interferon gamma, but Regular immunotherapy, when it succeeds, interferon gamma is a critical component about on it. But you only want it there for a relatively short time because if you have it in the chronic phase, if it's chronic in your host, you'll see that there's systemic autoimmune diseases I'll be talking about today. So this was the slide that I made that really started the project. Interferon gamma has been cloned from more species than I think any other regulatory cytokine. And when you line up the three prime untranslated region of the gene, you see this amazing evolutionary conservation that these sequences, they're not part of the coding region, but they're more, co more conserved than the coding region itself. And so we asked a very basic research question with no preconditions and no anticipation of finding out something about disease. We just asked, why are these sequences so conserved? So, and you can see this conservation when you compare the human gamma interferon messenger RNA and the mouse gamma interferon messenger RNA. And critically, they have these AUUA rich regions in both genes that are just about identical. So what did we do? We replaced those ARE sequences with random nucleotides. What did we get? We got a stable interferon gamma messenger RNA that's expressed mostly in T cells and NK cells. And I might add NKT cells. And that has resulted in chronic ex protein expression in the serum. Why is this a value? Because this model enables both short-term and long-term assessment of the effects of interferon gamma on host tissue and, in, as I'll show you, on mouse behavior. So development of this model of chronic inflammation due to interferon gamma expression has led to the phenotypes that resemble a number of human autoimmune diseases. SLE for lupus, primary biliary cholangitis, which is, occurs in 90%, 90% of the cases are in women, cardiac dysfunction that turns out is in the male mice, Ovea, we think it's a new model for ovarian failure syndrome. And when we put the, the construct onto a BALB-C mouse background, we got aplastic anemia. And so this has provided a model to develop approaches for clinically relevant disease information intervention. Now I might add that there is strain differences because the other diseases we find in black six mice, but when we, like I said, put it on valve C, we got aplastic anemia. And the black six phenotype is dominant because when we cross back black six and valve C, the mice did not get aplastic anemia. Yet interferon gamma has been known to be a critical feature in aplastic anemia. So our research aims were to understand the basis for the role of gamma and other cytokines in autoimmune diseases 
develop the clinically relevant therapies that can reverse or block the autoimmune phenotypes, analyze the impact of the existing autoimmunity on the development and progression of cancer. And I'm not gonna really talk about that today, but I can refer you to a paper we just published in Cancer Research where my staff scientist, Julio Valencia, was the first author. And it, it looks at our uh, investigation of cancer and cancer treatment in the context of a mouse autoimmune phenotype. And that's really, that we think, important because patients with autoimmune diseases have been largely excluded from immunotherapy trials. And so we think this is the first mouse model that, we've used, that has been used to look at uh, cancer in the background of autoimmune diseases. So this just shows you the half-life of the messenger RNA, which is the very basic reason. So with the, we call it ARE-DEL, um, and it's really a substitution of the AU-rich region. You can see the message is much more stable than in the uh, a wild type where uh, it's a uh, half-life of about one and a half to two hours, but it's much more stable than that in the uh, knockout animal. And then when we look in the different tissues, black being in the ARE mouse, you can see there's interfering gamma messenger RNA in many tissues. And so there's a chronic expression. Now, we don't know what triggers that chronic expression. It could be the microbiome that uh, normally you get a, a short burst of interferon gamma, but it, because it's quickly degraded the message that it goes away and the, uh, um, you don't see any circulating gamma in the serum. Um, but there's a gamma messenger RNA that could be detected in many, many different organisms in the mouse. But one of the things you, people ask when they see a mouse model, well, is this really relevant to human disease? I mean, it's a mouse model and the levels of gamma may not be equivalent, but here we, uh, I'm showing some data courtesy of Janssen Pharmaceuticals that measured gamma interferon in a, in a subset of, I believe it was lupus patients, 99, and the levels of gamma are in the order of four to really 16 picograms per mil which are just about exactly what we see in our mouse model. So uh, we believe that the mouse model is thus very relevant to human disease because the circulating gamma we see is the same as what's been found in patients. And for one, one of the first things we looked at was uh, the development of lupus because there are, uh, I've had one colleague tell me that all mouse models of lupus depend upon interfering gamma. And so you can see in this slide that we see strong anti-single-stranded DNA, anti-double-stranded DNA, which are characteristics of... Uh... We also see, as you can see here in some staining, we also see um, Ig deposition in the kidneys um, and a decrease in complement in the serum because it's getting the deposited in the kidneys, as you can see from this slide. And, and like I said, I'm not gonna spend a lot of detail on any one slide because I want to get the flavor of the work across to you all. Um, you can always contact me for more details or uh, interest in, in working together. And here's just a, a, a stain of deposition of immunoglobulins within the kidney capillary walls. So that's a, I consider that science is art. And then one of the things we found was we found a loss of marginal zone macrophages in the spleen. And, that we, and you can see that in the Markle boxes uh, in the bottom pad, very bottom lane. Um, there's no Markle stimulation. And that uh, indicated a loss of these marginal zone macrophages, which meant they couldn't clear up the B cells. And there's B cell abnormalities in the mouse as well. So there, we, we wanted to ask the question, are there other autoimmune diseases that occur in ARE del mice? And, Interestingly, I had a postdoc, Rachel Bai, come in and look in the liver. It turns out people who study lupus in the mouse never look in the liver. Um, and I'm not, I don't mean to imply that lupus patients get cholangitis. Some do, but it's not necessarily prevalent. But let's not forget that in mice, we're working with a genetically uh, pure strain in contrast to people. Uh, primary biliary cholangitis used to be called primary biliary cirrhosis, but the patients didn't like that because it implied they had an alcohol problem and they don't. It's a co chronic cholestatic autoimmune liver disease that leads to cirrhosis and liver failure. 90% of cases are in females. There's the incidence, it's highest in Northern European countries. 
And there's lymphocyte infiltration near portal tracts and destruction of the small bile ducts, which is high induction of serum bile acids. And 90 to 95% of patients have anti-mitochondrial antibodies. It's not understood quite why, but they do. And that's one of the diagnostic features of the disease. And there is a treatment, but 40% of women respond poorly and um, uh, better treatments are needed. Um, so, and, and, my, and I've been working on this project with a colleague who's the leading clinician in the country on this disease, Eric Gershwin at UC Davis. And he's made a slide of like 17 characteristics of the human disease and the mouse matches 16 of the 17 characteristics. So in his mind and other liver labs that we provided this to, this turns out to be what they believe to be the best model for PB, uh, PBC that's been available. And here you can see where we stained um, the female the tissues and you can see much more lymphocyte into, uh, infiltration into the liver by the bile ducts than compared to the males. And the wild type, you don't see any. And so here's a quantitation of portal inflammation are greater than the females and the males. Uh, lobular inflammation is also greater. Bile duct damage is greater. And granulomas are greater as well. So this was in 20-week-old mice. And here you can see staining uh, in the female homozygote mice. Now, um, as I'll tell you later, the female homozygotes don't breed very well, but we think that's due to ovarian ovarian failure syndrome that I'll show you a little bit later. You can see here, there's, bile, there's a strong infiltration of lymphocytes um, throughout the different uh, aspects of the liver um, indicating, and this is a, a slide that would be very similar to a human biopsy uh, with regard to the lymphocyte infiltration. And here's some additional strain is staining that says the liver immune infiltrates consist of T cells and B cells. And we haven't studied the B cells very much, so we don't know what they're doing there. Um, that's one of the characteristics of staining. And we've also stained the interfering alpha receptor, receptor knockout mouse in the bottom panel. And you can see that there's a demi, there's uh, still some staining, uh, but the disease is actually a little bit less severe when we've knocked out the interferon alpha gene as well. And so that's one of the other cytokines that's involved in this disease. And here in the homozygote females, you can see total bile acids, is, bile acids are very high. In fact, I, I think I was the first NCI to use the company Metabolome, and they did metabol metabolomic studies on the mouse, and they came back with all these high total bile acids. And for a number of years, I had no idea what that meant. And it wasn't until Rachel came into the lab and started looking at uh, the tissues um, to say that there was... Uh, um, something going on in the liver. And then with Eric Gershwin's um, help, we were able to better define that it's PBC. And you can see the heterozygous are variable, but that's because in the heterozygous mice, um, the amount of gamma interferon is variable depending on which loci is being transcribed, whether it's the ARE deletion the loci or the wild type. And so we see a much wider range of gamma interferon levels, and we believe that correlates with the total bile acids. And one interesting thing is that it's, uh, it's also turning out it could be a model for osteopenia. Um, Eric Gershwin said this is very common in women with uh, PBC. And you can see the calcium bone density in the females goes way down in the homozygotes and it's also down in the heterozygotes. But it's not really down in the males. So this, again, is a female-based uh, um, disease. And like I said, this is very frequently seen in the patients and is another example of why our mouse is, is a good model for this disease. And we're actually working with a couple of companies now who have drugs which they think can stop the disease. And I'll show you some work from Dr. Gershwin's lab with some work we did about trying to prevent the disease. So we also wanted to know, might, if, might other cytokines have a role in the observed autoimmune diseases? And this is work done by my staff scientists Julio Valencia and my technician, Mike Sanford. And what they found was, to our surprise at the time, was there was a direct correlation of levels of IL-27 that, that correlated directly with the levels of the interferon gamma. As you can see as the, the panel on the right, you can see there's a, a really strong correlation between interferon gamma and IL-27 levels. 
and it's much higher, the IL-27 in the homozygote area you know, than the heterozygote, but it's still increased. And then when we block on the left panel, when we, throw, we uh, treat the animals with anti-interferon gamma antibody, the levels of interferon gamma, of course, go down, but the levels of IL-27 also decrease when we treat with the levels, with this, the antibodies to that neutralize interferon gamma. So again, the interferon gamma is inducing the 27, and we believe that 27 is also inducing at least some of the gamma production. IL-27, for those who are not familiar with this cytokine, is a member of the IL-12 cytokine family. TH1 cells are promoted through IL by IL-27 through activation. And of course, in our mice, there are many more TH1 cells than uh, TH2. TH2 cells and TH17 cells are inhibited by IL-27. And it's also been involved in the production of IL-10 by stimulating various subsets of T cells, especially T reg cells. And we are studying the T reg cells. I won't show you any data, but we had a in very preliminary results. There may be a sex difference in the ability of the T regs to uh, suppress an immune response as well, but that's still preliminary and bears repeating. So can we reverse disease? This we felt was an important uh, question that's very relevant to the treatment of this disease. So you can see that treatment in the kidney and the liver with anti-interferon gamma antibody does in fact reduce the lymphocyte infiltration into the liver. And this is important because there is a clinically approved uh, anti-interferon gamma antibody that's out there, although not for this disease, but it offers the possibility that maybe neutralizing gamma interferon directly uh, can do that. And, Antibodies are expensive, so we're going to hopefully work with a company that has made an app diverted interferon gamma to see if that can also be effective in inhibiting disease. But we also did some other things. We, uh, we had a homozygote mouse, a heterozygote mouse, uh, that had one copy of the IL-27 receptor. And you can see on the bottom panel compared to the top, where the top panel, top right, of 20x where the IL-27 receptor is there, you see strong lymphocyte infiltration again into the liver. However, when we cross that mouse with the um, IL-20 uh, heterozygote of the IL-27 receptor, we saw a much decreased level of um, infiltration. And we think this may be affecting the macrophage population in the mice and uh, defining their characteristics that uh, part of the project that Dr. Gershwin is working on. Now also, we finally, we did get some anti-IL-27 antibody. And you can see that again, with the IL-27 antibody, and the measurements are on the right, we see a decrease in, in uh, lymphocyte infiltration into the liver. So that may be another way to treat, although there is no clinically approved yet, IL-27 antibody, neutralizing antibody for the clinic. And I have to admit, I'm unaware if there's a sex bias in IL-27 expression. Like I said, females do express more interferon gamma than males, and that may be a big reason why we see the disease in, in females uh, predominantly. And so this is data that I just got from Eric Gershwin last week, where they were treating mice with the clinically approved JAK-STAT inhibitor ruxolitinib. And as you can see on the left, the treatment showed very, very nice results that it inhibited the lymphocyte infiltration. And it looks like it was going, uh, importantly, to, to cure the disease in, in women. And that's not only true for the portal inflammation, but it's also true for the bile duct damage. You can see the control on the right and the treated mice on the left. And they treated for eight weeks and then um, uh, sacrificed the mice to look at the so this is very, we're very excited about this because this is a clinically approved drug. It has many uses, but for women who don't do well on the existing PBC therapy, this might be uh, very worthy of a clinical trial to see if this works and comparing maybe to anti-interferon gamma since that's also clinically available. So looking at uh, what we've seen so far is that chronic expression of gamma results in autoimmune cholangitis the female predominance, increased skin pigmentation, which I haven't shown you, upregulation of total bile acids, spontaneous production of AMA, anti-mitochondrial antibodies, 
Like I said, that occurs in 90 to 95% of PDC patients and our female mice also make the anti-mitochondrial antibodies. And of course, portal duct inflammation, which is causing a leakage of bile acids into the serum. Serum cytokine analysis revealed that IL-27 was upregulated, potentially impacting disease, disease progression. And there's a strong correlation between interferon gamma and 27 levels. And inhibition of IL-27 or interferon gamma reverses damage to the liver. And treatment with the JAK1 and JAK1-2 inhibitor, ruxolitinib, also uh, reverses the damage. So we, as a, our future plans are test-targeted therapy, as I said, um, and that's already being done. Determinative of sex has steroids play a role in the female bias disease phenotype. Well, there is an estrogen response element in the promoter of the gamma interferon gene, the mouse gamma interferon gene, but by itself, it doesn't induce transcription, but it can enhance transcription. So that may be contributing to the female bias. And we haven't done much on this yet, but we want to examine the impact of diet or alterations in the gut microbiome on the autoimmune phenotype. Um, we don't know if it'll have an effect, and we've not yet put our animals into germ-free or germ-free uh, conditions yet to see if this means is attenuated. And so the Carol, just a general summary slide of the characteristics of the uh, some of the SLE and PDC disease we've seen. There's macrophage dysfunction. We do see in the homozygotes a gut microbial alteration. And we believe that impairs early B cell maturation tolerance, germinal cell B cell development that occurs in producing anti-nuclear antibodies and high affinity autoantibodies resulting in autoimmunity. But one of the things we wanted to do next was we wanted to look at behavioral issues because there have been some very nice papers from the Kipnis lab at UVA saying gamma interferon can affect the brain. And we know that uh, we did have some brain scans done in a preliminary basis, and it looked like our mice had fewer blood, blood vessels in the brain. But John Fenimore in my lab did this uh, for swim test, and hopefully I can get this to work. So this is the wild type mouse. You can see it swims very nice, did a little poop for us. And then it, we, we actually found uh, that the mice failed the poop test. And most people don't know what the poop test is. But the poop test, when you pick up a mouse by its tail and put it in a new cage, it'll automatically. And I called up people in the uh, neuro at NIH in Bethesda and they said, is this valid? And they told me oh, this was an old test for mouse depression. Yeah. And um, so the next panel is the heterozygote mice. You can see the mouse swims a little bit slower, but it's able to stay upright. And it's swimming, it gets going pretty well and swims pretty well. And here's the homozygote mice. You can see it starts out swimming and then stops. And this was, a, you saw the same time frames. And in fact, its rear legs start to sink. And if we don't pull the mouse out, it's gonna drown. Um, so you can see it can't keep flat anymore anyway. So um, working with uh, people in the Heart Institute, um, they were able to help us do electrocardiograms on the mouse. And they found that there is, a, after a 90 second stress test of the mice, there's a decrease in the heart function that's appearing in the echocardiogram. And this is true for the male mice. This is what the surprise was. It's true for the male mice, not the female mice. They seem to not have as much of this. And here is again, this is the heart. Uh, this is the normal mouse. You can see the valve is closing properly. But in the homozygote, heterozygote not male mouse, you can see it's not closing properly. I'll run them both together. So you can see how it closes all fully here, but in this mouse, it doesn't. So John's been characterizing what's going on in this mouse and why is there this heart defect in males. And it turns out in males that have lupus, the small percentage that do, they have an increased incidence of heart issues. Um, compared to the normal male population. So when looking at the mouse, we found in the male mice that there's multifocal cardiomyocyte degeneration and necrosis that's present along with the large foci of mineralization. So there's definitely heart defects in the heart. But we also found heart muscle transition 
electron microscopy that there's problems with the mitochondria, that they're fusing and they're not looking uh, healthy in the male heart of the knockout mouse. Uh, as you can see, the wild type compared to the male. And we also found that after the swim test, there's much higher levels of uh, lactic acid in the serum. So their average levels of serum lactic acid, uh, this is what's showing here. And you can see that the uh, knockout mouse have much higher levels of lactic acid. So they're also getting um, exhausted very quickly because of the metabolism differences. This is ongoing within the lab to find out what these differences are. So summary two, that the ARE gal male mice show an unexpected heart defect that appears after exercise. The serum metabolite changes are observed after exercise and the heart tissue shows degeneration and mineralization foci. And like I said, John is looking at the effects of beta blockers, which seem to overcome some of this. And we're of course working with uh, Danielle Springer and others in the Heart Institute because we are not cardiologists. And Sam Das from Hopkins has also been helping us. Uh, we wanna test for mitophagy in the heart tissue, look at what happens to other cytokines. And we're actually working with a German company that has human heart organoids, and they are very interested in seeing the effects of NAM interferon and those organized function. And we wanna contribute genes that uh, contribute to the heart inflammation. And John has been working with this and finding a number of genes involved in metabolism and mitochondrial function seem to be involved. There's one other thing I want to show you about the, uh, the um, mice, and that's the light dark preference. So here is a mouse that's wild type. You can see it comes out of the dark area and really keeps looking around the light area quite extensively and exploring and investigating. So now I'm going to go to the the wild the ARE Dell mouse, and I just clicked on it so the uh, video started, but you can see the mouse is not coming out yet. So it'll just take a minute, I think. There he comes out finally, and he looks around, explores a little bit, but immediately heads back into the darkness. So we think there's also behavioral difficulties and we haven't been able to do much on brain chemistry yet, but we think it's also impacting the brain and maybe uh, affecting its light dark preference as well as its, uh, some of its other functions. So now finally, in the last part of the talk, I'm gonna talk about the characterization, characterization of autoimmune ovarian failure. And Tomei before a uh, postdoc in my lab, uh, is a real expert in female reproduction and she's been studying this. And when we breed these mice, we have to breed heterozygotes um, because homozygotes won't breed. Although when we, a Japanese company licensed the mice and they were able to use homozygote sperm for in vitro fertilization um, uh, of the heterozygote eggs. And that worked, they were able, so the sperm were viable, but uh, the mice don't mate uh, properly, so we have to meet the heterozygotes and we get less than 25% homozygotes. So that's put a damper on our research to some extent because we want the mice and we have trouble getting enough homozygotes. But uh, premature ovarian failure occurs in about 10% of women less than 40 years old. In autoimmune disease, the ovarian damage is caused primarily by T cells, CD8 cells, mediating the injury. But the mechanisms of PRF are currently unknown. Existing animal models lack some clinical features. So we believe our study presents a new model with characteristic features of the disease. And you can see here just some of the data that uh, the cytotoxic uh, T cells are up in the summary table, uh, but the NK cells are not in the bottom left. Um, in the ovaries on the top left, you can see the CD8 cells are up and in the uterus, in the top right, you can see the, uh, the homozygote mice, the uh, cytotoxic T cells are also up. And when you compare the mouse to the clinic, both have CD8 T cells in the ovaries, both have infiltration of theca and granulosa cells, and the NK cells are down in the ovaries in both human and, and the mouse. So again, this model is showing a great similarity uh, with human disease. When we look, when Tomei looked at all and auto ovarian antibodies, she found in much higher levels in the uh, homozygote knockout mouse. And we're kind of reserving all our homozygotes for her 
Um, uh, but it was very clear. And we also, thanks to Michael Leonakis, he gave us a hint to take the serum from the mouse and stain um, the, the reproductive tissues in rag mice that wouldn't have any antibodies. And although I don't have a slide of that, uh, they do, the serum from uh, the homozygote mice does cause fluorescence on the tissues in the rag mice, indicating there are anti-uterine and ovarian antibodies in the homozygote mouse. So here's just some pictures that we is just showing that in the mouse, there's an atrophied ovary with low follicular res reserve, and there's hemorrhaging in the mouse as well. And so overall, um, ARE del mice, female mice show clinical features of autoimmune PDOF. This presents this mouse as a novel autoimmune model with new me me mechanistic insight. And of course, um, and this slide was from Tome and uh, many people in my lab that helped her as well as our animal facility. But this again shows that this mouse could be potentially, uh, if we can treat the mice with either the JAK-STAT inhibitor or anti-gamma and see if they get pregnant, it may be uh, form the basis for ways to help women who have this syndrome and can't uh, bear uh, children. So this is uh, the, um, uh, Christmas time picture, a holiday luncheon picture from over two years ago, not recent. And the people on the left are in my lab or former members of the lab. And Eric Gershwin has been a real collaborator uh, um, that made this project, turned it into what it became. And like I said, based on his input, uh, we've now given the mice to a number of other liver labs in Europe and in the States. And they're all telling me that it's following human disease almost exactly, if not exactly. And we want to thank uh, Danielle Springer for the hard work. She's been a, a joy to work with, and it's really been a great asset to us, uh, along with the other people you see listed here that are just some of the collaborators. And like I said, I'm very happy to collaborate with uh, anyone at any time. I think that's the way what makes NIH different. And I'd look forward to any questions. Hope you uh, got an overview of what the mouse looks like. Thank you so much, Dr. Young. That was a really um, a fascinating presentation. I certainly um, got a lot out of it. And I have seen some questions come in on the chat. Um, and um, Christina Lenata, did you want to unmute and ask your question? Hi, I'm, I'm a Shira Blazer. I'm here with Christina <laughs> visiting, <laughs> visiting from uh, New York. Um, yeah, so, so my question was, um, you know, what is interferon gamma doing to change behavior? Is it altering the blood-brain barrier as, you know, some of Betty Diamond's work suggests, perhaps allowing for other cytokines to come in? Or um, is there some other mechanism for this? Yeah, we, we don't know. We have, I have a small lab and we haven't been able to study the brain very much. Uh, but there's definitely interferon gamma in the brain, so it, does, it is affecting the barrier. But what it's doing, we, and like I said, we did have a company that did a brain scan for us, and although only on a few mice, it looked like there were fewer blood vessels in the brain. Mm -hmm. So maybe the brain is lacking uh, you know, uh, substantial circulation and affecting the behavior. But uh, you know, most people who work in like lupus models would never do a, a swimming test on their mice. So uh, most yeah. people doing the animal models don't do that. So it was uh, very reproducible, that test, to say the least. Sure. I had I had actually an, another question. I think I was like the first time I, under, I, I know that there's inter, interferon gamma expression is much higher in females, healthy females. Is that right? And, yes. And why? Why is that? Is there is there any? No, I don't think that's well known quite yet. Um, it might be that, like I said, that there's an estrogen response element in the promoter of the gene, uh, which enhances transcription. But I don't think it's clear as to why there's a sex difference in uh, the interferon gamma levels. But uh, it's been well documented in the mice that there is, and, and I've seen documentation in women as well. Thank and you. that lupus slide I showed you from Janssen, where it was elevated, that, of course, is uh, just about, all, I think it's all women. That slide was from serum from all women. That's interesting. Thank you. Thank you both for those questions. Um, uh, Lawrence Baser, would you like to unmute? Yeah, thanks so much. It's a great model. So many questions you can ask. A couple of questions I had was, have you looked at for any other manifestations of autoimmune disease like um, rheumatoid arthritis or something like that in the mice, joint yeah, infiltra we... infiltration? Or um, one more thing, um, 
Myasthenia gravis or anything like that? No, we haven't looked at gravis. We thought there would be uh, gut inflammation, but surprisingly, there's not. For, so we, that was one of the things we did predict when we did the mouse that we might get more gut inflammation. Uh, we also think there might be, you know, where I'm trying to get somebody interested in looking at the thyroid in the mouse, but we haven't looked at, but we, we don't, the mice live a good long time. So uh, uh, they can live at least a year and then we have to cull them because we don't have any room in the facility, but they don't seem to show any arthritis type of symptoms, but we haven't challenged them to know if they would get more. Uh, they, the mice were challenged in a, a gut inflammation model. And they did get uh, more disease in the challenge than a normal type, but they don't get spontaneous disease. And we've also not seen any spontaneous tumors in the mice. Interesting. So one more question, if I might. Sure. So the elevated expression of interferon is present from birth or maybe before. Yes. Yes. So, but there's no apparent developmental effects of that. You said they live, you know, a robust lifespan. No, they, there's not any developmental effects. Interestingly, we did an experiment where we treated mice with antibiotics before we mated them and kept the females on antibiotics. And they actually gave they died because the, the fetus were too big for the birth canal. So we got these enlarged fetuses. <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't deliver because they were too big. And so we don't know what's going on there. But, uh, um, and we haven't treated for antibiotics for a continuously long time to see if there would be other effects or diminution of disease. All right, great. Thanks a bunch. I'll let somebody else ask a question. Sure. Thanks so much. We have a question from uh, Dr. Sharon Hunter, if you'd like to unmute. Oh, yes. Hi. Thank you very much for your presentation. I was just following up on the on the prior question with the mention of rheumatoid arthritis in myasthenia gravis. And, and if I recall, you mentioned the uh, so the osteoporotic uh, um, uh, Mo development of sort of osteoporosis. Yes. So I was wondering about their mobility um, in that sense. Uh, do they show uh, differences in mobility or have you looked at bone um, um, uh, uh, at bone to see uh, uh, if it's uh, consistent with this osteoporosis, osteoporotic phenotype? Yeah, well, uh, there's definitely gonna be interfering gamma expression in the bone marrow. So we think that's consistent with it as well. But we've not looked at that. I haven't heard that from any, from John, who's been working with the mice and, or from the animal handlers, that there's any mobility issues with the mice. But it may be you really have to age them before we'd see it. Uh, but normally we don't see that, although based on the calcium densities decreased in the females, we might expect them to be much more susceptible to uh, uh, arthritis. Right. Yeah. If I could just follow up on that. So sure. um, do you age any of the animals? We've aged them up to about a year. And okay. like I said, then we have to cull them because we don't have any room in our animal facility. Sure. Um, okay. All right. Well, thank you. Sure. Thank you. And we also have a question from Amelia Hofstadter. If you're I am asking on. if you have looked into what might interact with these AUUA rich regions in the gamma promoter? Yeah, that's, so that's a binding site for the TTP complex, which is a, a complex that binds to those sites in many genes and causes, causes degradation of the messenger RNA. Um, TTP, uh, many genes have AUUA rich sequences, but, uh, the, but there's not homology as there is within gamma interfering gene for multiple species. But it's TTP and the knockout of the TTP done by Perry Blackburn at uh, NIEHS is, uh, um, has shown defects in some gamma and other cytokine production. But uh, there's also a microRNA binding site and there's conflicting reports on the role of that binding site. One lab said it's uh, critical for interfering gamma messenger RNA stability. And another lab said, no, it's the TBET stability, the transcription factor that that it's critical for interfering gamma expression uh, and vice versa. So uh, um, we've only, we haven't looked at that very much. Uh, we'll leave that to the RNA biology people. But it is a TTP binding site. Thank you. We also have a question from Dr. Janine Clayton. Hi, Dr. Young. I really enjoyed your presentation. Um, we described some many years ago. Uh, women with premature ovarian insufficiency that have inflammation in the ocular surface. 
Have you had a chance to look at the conjunctiva or the lacrimal glands in the eyes? Well, of these we, we did have the, with my friend, dear friend, Rachel Caspi, she helped us get the eyes to be looked at at the eye institute. They didn't see anything in the eyes, but the they, mice were only probably 16 to 20 weeks old. So we've not looked at those other glands or the eyes in old mice, although we've not heard anything from animal handlers saying there's unexpected inflammation in the eyes. So. Yeah, I, I encourage you to look at the aged mice as well. Might yeah, be, no, they'd be yeah. the aging with chronic gamma could cause it many additional diseases. Absolutely. Yeah, appreciate your presentation. Thank you so much. Sure. Thanks. It looks like we also have a question from Yang Jun Sui. Hi, nice talk. So I'm wondering, did you look at, uh, did you observe any epigenetic changes? Uh, no, we haven't looked at that. Um, we think. We had we actually had Amgen do complete uh, very thorough gene array analysis when they were selling an anti gamma interferon antibody that they were hoping to put one in the clinic. So we have a lot of uh, early data on expression in uh, from three, six, and twelve week old mice and males and females um, in uh, the kidney, bone marrow, and uh, blood. Um, and so we've seen that when it's the, the mice do not appear to get tolerant to interfering gamma. So there's certainly in, inducing genes, uh, many, many genes, that over, well over 100 genes can be induced by interfering gamma. Um, and so, and they differ in the organs. So it's not like every organ has the same genes induced. Uh, but we didn't go into the epigenetics of that. Uh, uh, phenomenon, but it, uh, you know, we had a lot of work done by Amgen that didn't cost us a penny, so that was good, and we finally got that published a couple of years ago. Um, but there's a, you know, there's a chronic genes that are up at early can stay up, so there's no tolerance to interferon gamma where genes would go back to basal level. And so, yeah, so biology is multidisciplined. Uh, I know people tend to be reductionist, and um, Gamma may be at the top of the pile with other genes that it's inducing, causing some of the effects, certainly in the mitochondria and the heart tissue, for sure. Thank you. Thanks. And it looks like we also have a question from Walter Hubert. Yeah, this is Walter Hubert from Frederick. Uh, uh, thank you for a wonderful talk, uh, uh, Dr. Young. Do you think, uh, are the mitochondrial epitopes known which lead to that antibody production? Yes, they are. And I, I don't have details on that, but Eric Gershwin has mapped that because I asked them, could epitopes be the same in the gut bacteria? Uh, so is it a mimicry that is causing the anti-mitochondrial antibodies? And they're not sure. I think the answer is probably no, but uh, they, don't, they don't know why uh -huh. there are mitochondrial antibodies, but they have mapped the epitopes for those. Yes. yes is it, would it be possible that the myocyte damage that is perhaps seen in the, in the heart muscle in other places could contribute to priming the immune system for that antibody production? Yes, but don't forget the heart problems are in the male mice and they don't have uh -huh. as much of the anti-mitochondrial antibodies. So. That's true. Okay. Yeah. Thank so you so much. The females that, and that, that was a big surprise to us. You know, this is a mouse that, uh, we thought it was going to be totally female biased, and it turns out there's a male problem. And if it hadn't been for Johns and Quiz that have nature to do a swim test, we never would have discovered that. But that shows you the joy of working at NIH because we we immediately got in contact with Danielle Springer at the Heart Institute, and she was wonderful in helping us do some new, new initial and continuing studies. And it just shows you the interaction of the community. I mean, if for those of you who haven't signed up for the Immunology Interest Group listserv you're missing out because there's 2,300 subscribers to that list sir, because people at NIH are all here to help one another succeed. Dr. People Young. told me on the outside, I never would have gotten funding for this project. <laughs> I'm asking a very basic question. So, and well, like I said, we had no pre-consideration uh, that we were gonna see a specific disease. We just asked the very basic research question about why those sequences were so conserved. Dr. Young, that actually raises a question I had um, as to what prompted you to look at sex differences and to look um, more specifically at males and females. Was it the female preponderance in autoimmune disease or um, the recognition of sex differences or the 
um, SABV policy. Just I'm curious about your process in pursuing this line of inquiry. Well, you know, given that our first data suggested a lupus-like condition in the mouse with the anti-double-stranded and single-stranded DNA antibodies and the kidney pathology when we did that pathology, that led us to the female bias. And it, like I said, it wasn't until a postdoc, Rachel Bai, came to the lab and she began to look at the liver. And she's, you know, she said, she contacted Dr. Gershman directly. She said, well, there's cl this clinician that works on the disease. Can I write to him? I said, absolutely. And he immediately said, send us tissues. We'll stain. We'll do this and that. And they did all of that. And one of the first things they stained for was the anti mitochondrial antibodies. And they came back positive. So it was the initial mice. It took us two years to get the first mouse, but it was the initial mice that showed us some lupus-like conditions um, that prompted us to look at the sex difference. And, you know, right now I tell people, whenever I review papers, one of my questions is, did you look at both sexes whenever the paper comes out? And also it's important to realize that, uh, um, you know, if you don't look at both sexes, you're gonna miss something because if we had only looked at male mice, we would have missed these diseases. And like I said, I, I, I always get, very happy when I hear from the Yale Liver Laboratory because they almost always tell me this is another match for your mouse to human disease and they want you know and they send me the data so um, but it was important to look at both sexes and I think in any model if you don't look at both sexes you're missing something uh, well you're obviously missing something and you have to do that now so great glad to hear that I'm not seeing any additional questions in the chat, um, but would like to remind folks that you can um, put a question in the chat or unmute if you desire. And feel yes, free to contact more. me. Okay. Yes, Larry. One more question, if I might. Um, you mentioned sure. effects of genetic background. Have you looked at that systematically, like crossing the mutation in the variety of mouse strains? You know, we'd love to do that, but we just don't have the resources to do Yeah, that. understood. Yeah, but you know, the surprise was that the, in the mice diet, of calcium, the Bauxi mice definitely have aplastic anemia, and we published that, I think it was in blood. Um, but uh, they also have calcium deposition in the liver and kidney, and they die by about 10 weeks. So they were much harder to work with, and um, you had to work fast. But yes, well, you would expect different diseases potentially by crossing them to different strains. Yeah. Yeah, so thanks. Really any additional questions? Well, I'd thank, like to thank the audience for sticking with me. And I hope, you know, feel free to email me at any time uh, about the mouse or if you have a tissue you'd like to look, have looked at, we can always harvest it for you. Um, I'm up in Frederick, but we interact well with labs in Bethesda and elsewhere. So uh, it was a real joy to be able to present my work. And I thank you all for listening. And we are just so thankful that you were able to join us today. Um, Dr. Clayton, if you would like to see the camera on. Yeah, I just wanted to thank Dr. Young. Um, I, I came from NEI Intramural, so definitely I've seen your presentations before and it was just really delightful to hear about um, the model and, and the way you thought through it and really that this was based on the data. The data took you to this place. Right. Yeah, I think and I misspoke Perry's name. It's probably Perry Blackshear that's worked on TTP and we communicated not. I think I said the wrong last name. But anyway, no, it's uh, thank you for attending. It was, uh, oh, absolutely. Pleasure. Really appreciate it. Your work. Back to you, Elizabeth. I guess we can close out. Sure. And just as a reminder to everyone, if you'd like to receive additional information about um, today's presentation or um, the SIG, the Sex and Gender and Health and Disease SIG, we encourage you to just put your name in the chat and we will um, follow up with you uh, offline. And I also... Um, to further your interest in sex and gender and health and disease, we would like you to be aware that ORWH has a suite of e-learning courses aimed at educating the biomedical community on sex and gender. And um, our three courses are shown on this slide. We have the Bench to Bedside, Integrating Sex and Gender to Improve Human Health, Sex as a Biological Variable, which has both a primer as well as a set of supplemental videos, and Introduction to the Scientific Basis of Sex and Gender-Related Differences. These courses are free and available on the ORWH website. Um, and 
again, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I do have one question about your courses. What grade levels are they appropriate for? That's a fantastic question. So the bench to bedside course um, is aimed at the biomedical and allied health professional public health research community. So um, it would be appropriate for graduate students and beyond um, anyone looking, including um, clinicians, anyone looking to bolster their understanding of sex and gender. And that course will um, be offering CMEs in the future. The SABV primer is um, appropriate for the research community, trainees, um, as well as trainers. And the introduction to the scientific basis course would be appropriate for um, anyone with an interest in science of sex and gender. Okay, thanks. I think our high school students that when we can get back to normal, and have them back in the laboratories might benefit from seeing those. So, absolutely. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you for what you do, it's a very important. Thank you. And um, this will conclude today's meeting. Okay. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much. Great.